Hi, I'm Femi OK. Thanks for watching the stream. If you want to be part of our conversation today, you can be on YouTube. Let me tell you the topic first of all, though. I know you're going to be intrigued by this. The fallout of a train that was derailed in Ohio earlier on this year, carrying toxic material, could change the future of rail safety in the United States. Could change the future. In the film Derailed, brought to us by the Al Jazeera Fault Lines team, they investigate how safe rail transport is in the United States. Let's take a look. Just normal Friday night, watching TV, watching Netflix, and everything changed. At almost nine o'clock, our house rumbled and it shook. I knew instantly that the train derailed. The derailment has prompted questions about rail safety in the U.S and if this disaster could have been prevented. For years, railroad workers have warned that changes in the industry were compromising safety. It was a disaster waiting to happen, and it happened. On today's episode, addressing the fallout from the East Palestine, Ohio train derailment. What can be done? How can rail, rail transport be made more safe? Joining us today, Jessica Conrad is a community activist and joins us from East Palestine in Ohio. Jamie Wallace is president of the Unity Council for East Palestine Train Derailment, and she is in the town of East Liverpool, Ohio. And Julia Rock is a reporter at The Lever. She joins us from New York City. Um, I wish that we were talking under better circumstances, but often when you have an incredible disaster, things begin to change in that community. Action happens, you change the future for other Americans, other people who might be in that same situation. Jessica, is that happening in East Palestine? Are you seeing, well, this is never going to happen again, ever? I would certainly like to see that this never happens again, and that's a goal that we're all working towards. I think that there are a lot of different policies that currently need to change in a lot of different areas, you know, from rail to health to the chemical industry, the plastics industry. Um, there's a lot of work to do, but I certainly think that we can uh, move forward. I think the first step in doing that is, uh, you know, asking Governor DeWine to declare an emergency in our area. When we talk about a toxic material derailment, Jamie, what does that mean? What was that like for you? Uh, it was very chaotic that night when, you know, we found out that there were chemicals on this train. Uh, they were telling you at, you know, pretty late at night that we needed to evacuate our homes. So we kind of grabbed our children and ran. A lot of us didn't even know where we were going to go um, or how long we were going to be gone. I would love to play this for you. This is Evan Clark. He spoke to us a little bit earlier about what you're being told about safety. This is what Evan said, and I'm going to get you to react off the back of it because I want you. I want to know how safe that you feel right now. What What do you know for sure? Here's Evan. First of all, I feel like the EPA hasn't given the residents of the area uh, in Ohio or Pennsylvania really good information about what chemicals were released during the spill and the subsequent burn, and what the real toxic uh, effects could be. So far, the line has been is that the air is fine and safe, and the water is fine and safe. Our international viewers, the EPA is the United States Environment Protection Agency. Jamie, you are nodding your head. Uh, you know, there's been zero transparency. Yeah. You don't have to be a scientist to know that when the evacuation was lifted on my in my community, we didn't even know what all chemicals were on the train. We still hadn't seen the manifest. Uh, the test results were not back from our creeks. They were not doing soil sampling. The only thing they were doing was coming into our homes with a device and testing our air. Um, since the derailment, Mark Durno from the federal EPA has admitted that that testing done on the water, or I'm sorry, I apologize, the testing done on the air was not done at a sufficient level. The machine they had, these chemicals would have had to been at five times the reportable level 
to pick it up in our homes. Other chemicals couldn't be picked up at all. So there was absolutely no testing that was done before they said it was safe to go back into our homes. Judy, what's going on here when residents are feeling we can't trust what we're being told about how safe we are? How can that happen? Uh, I mean, I'd be very curious. To... Judy, you go first, Jamie, then you pick up. Sure, yeah, I, I'd be curious to hear from the residents on this, but I think that one of the, the main challenges was just how much um, sort of chaos and uncertainty there was right in, you know, the wake of derailment at, as they were just talking about, you know, one one way I think to ensure trust in um, the EPA's testing procedures and in in the government's response is to sort of have a swift and very clear uh, response, and that that wasn't really what happened in in the wake of the derailment. Jamie, go ahead. What were you going to say? Oh, I was just going to say I agree. You know, there was zero transparency. Yeah. Um, had I went back in my home when they lifted that evacuation. And I had it demanded to have a toxicologist at my house. Uh, my daughter could not be here today. I would not be here talking to you today. So when you talk about trust in the EPA, uh, you, when you tell me that you knew that that air testing that you were doing on my house was not safe when you were doing it, it wasn't showing safe limits. It was showing nearly fatal limits. How do you trust someone that could have resulted, you know, their information could have resulted in your three-year-old daughter's death. I don't know if they'll ever get my trust back. Well, and I think to Jamie's point too, you have to really understand that a lot of times when they do measure in the homes, they're measuring at one single moment in time. So while the devices, you know, clearly are not measuring at compliance levels that would show whether or not we have uh, health impacts, and we know that, that they're uh, not showing that because we're having health impacts, right? But when you have these levels of regulatory compliance versus is it safe, you know, those terms are not synonymous synonymous. And I think it's really important to understand that you have an industrial standard for exposure, right, specifically to vinyl chloride, where maybe a, a, a worker would be exposed eight hours a day, you know, and then they'd have a degassing period over the weekend. Um, but for us that are living here, we do have this consistent exposure, and it is causing acute health issues. Um, it, it was kind of refreshing and while hard to swallow, the CDC did recognize that we are having health issues, that we have been exposed, but the shred of dignity comes in in that we, you know, have been validated um, and, and that's something new. That's something the EPA has not provided. You know, they continue to say that it's safe, it's safe, it's safe. And, you know, it's hard to swallow to just sit around and wait to get cancer, but, you know, at least we have some truths on the table. Uh, all right, so vinyl chloride was what that train was carrying. Um, now, uh, Jamie and Jessica, unfortunately, you're, you're experts on vinyl chloride. Jamie, what do we need to know about vinyl chloride? You need to know that it's, high, it's a highly carcinogenic, so the likelihood that people that are exposed to it will get cancer, uh, you know, it increases the risk. Um, also, you know, vinyl chloride was just one of those chemicals yeah. that was released uh, when they did this toxic explosion over our town. You know, something people aren't talking about is also what the combination of chemicals are going to do to our bodies. When they test for reportable limits of vinyl chloride, they only subject that subject to one single chemical. So what are all these chemicals combined even if they are below reportable levels doing to our bodies. They don't know. Uh, so as, you know, my, another member of Unity Council said, you know, we're all lab rats is what we are at this point. You know, um, like Jessica said, we know we're going to end up with cancer. So the government needs to step up and start studying our health now. They should have already done this. Uh, you know, at least if I die of cancer in 10 years, someone else can be saved by that research. 
And Jamie, you know, you you mentioned about the lack of political will to shift away from using this uh, known human carcinogen, which was actually deemed a human carcinogen back in 1974. So we've had almost 50 years That's to shift away time. from using this. Yeah, yeah. That's a long time. Um, you know, over 99% of vinyl chloride is used to make PVC plastics, which, you know, this roughly accounts for about, I would say about 12% of the plastics that we use in this country. Um, you know, and these are plastics that cannot be recycled. These are your number three plastics, uh, little kids' toys, PVC, piping, um, unnecessary plastic packaging. You know, these are things that all can be replaced by something else. And so I think it's a good start to move away from plastics by having something that, you know, we can uh, use alternative methods or materials. Um, plastics are, are really important in the healthcare industry. So I certainly don't think that we should necessarily shift away from those. But the ones that we can shift away from are the ones that vinyl chloride are responsible uh, for making. All right, Jessica and Jamie and Julia, we're getting some really interesting questions from our audience watching right now. I'm going to make this a speed round. Ask and answer them as quickly as you can. Karen says this is not only in Ohio where, where tr trains are transporting toxic, potentially deadly material. It's happening all over America. Jamie, you're nodding. Respond, please. I mean, that's the problem. And with the deregulation of the railroad, not only are they putting communities' lives in uh, all over the United States, but, you know, all over the world, but they're also putting our first responders, uh, you know, right in the direct line of harm. They're responding to these fires and most of the time not even knowing right. uh, what chemicals they're being exposed to. Another question from our viewers. Are the residents adjacent to the rail lines asked to consent what can and cannot be transported on the rail or are they offered any notice in advance? Jessica. No, we have no idea what's being transported. Um, you know, you have, we, we know what was on the train now, but I have never even really thought about what's been on the train. And I've lived here for, you know, I grew up here. Uh, so no, we have no idea. We have no say. There really isn't very much regulatory compliance. And you're right, this does impact more than just Ohio, more than just Pennsylvania. If you live near a railway, this could certainly happen for you. And even moving back into the vinyl chloride conversation, you know, these plastic manufacturing facilities are located in uh, areas that are low income or areas that are primarily populated by people of color. And this is a serious issue because there are economic um, impacts because of those as well as the health risks from just being around that um, in a residential space. Julia, we spoke earlier to Dave Aruka. He is from a transportation union. He identified not just the problem, but also the solution. Have a listen to him and then pick up from what you know from your reporting. Here's Dave. I would say the uh, single biggest thing that can improve the safety of our nation's freight net rail network would be an improvement of the safety culture in the first place. Uh, but I'm not sure that's really going to happen with the, the current business culture uh, leading the railroads down this you know dangerous path that they've, they've gone down. Um, you know these pressures have been applied by Wall Street um, and private equity folks, uh, and the cultures have now turned to uh, speed up everything, safety be damned. So he's he's exactly right that, you know, one of the, the main threats to safety on the railroads is the business model, which is that, you know, investors have been wanting the profits to be returned to them in the form of stock buybacks and dividends. So there has not been a lot of investment, both in the actual technology of the railways, but also in rail staff. You know, staffing levels had been cut on the railroads by like 30 percent in the decade leading up to the derailment. There is an effort in Congress right now to impose uh, stricter regulations on the railroads. It's being led by the two Ohio senators, Sherrod Brown and J.D. Vance. And it, it um, you know, would impose new restrictions on hazmat trains. The train that derailed, if you can believe it, the train that derailed in East Palestine was not being regulated as one of these hazmat trains. What, so it would direct the transport. That's yeah. how, how is that? Po and that's legal. That's OK. I mean, it's I legal because that. Go, please go ahead. Uh, our politicians are bought off. You can finish it. <laughs> uh, uh, go, go ahead, Julia. 
I mean, that, that, that's, the, that's the short answer. Uh, the long answer, you know, is that there was an effort to regulate hazmat trains back in 2015, uh, and chemical industry lobbyists, rail industry lobbyists uh, sort of pushed for a very narrow definition of hazmat trains. Safety regulators said that's not a good idea, uh, and, and Congress went with the lobbyists as they very often do. So one of the things that Fort Lines team did as they were investigating what happened in East Palestine, Ohio, was they were like, where are the politicians, where are the leaders in this? Why is this happening regularly? And this is what Josh came up with from the Fort Lines team. Have a listen, have a look. Well, the, the uh, freight railroad has uh, an inordinate uh, amount of clout in the United States Congress. Former Congressman Peter DeFazio told us it was nearly impossible to pass stricter legislation for the railroads during his three decades in Congress. I mean, they have been very resistant to anything that would deal with, you know, length of trains or, uh, you know, safety issues and, and other things over the years. So from your disaster, Jessica and Jamie, there is now a rail safety bill bipartisan. Does that make you feel like at least this could be a milestone in the history of US rail transport? What happened to us doesn't have to happen again. Jamie, you start. Jessica, you follow. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that is wonderful. It's definitely needed. Uh, you know, my only issue with that is, you know, I, while I appreciate the politicians doing that, we also have residents that are still in their homes that are actively being exposed to these chemicals. Mm -hmm. Now that Norfolk Southern has been ordered to dig the tracks up, they had done this burn of chemicals in a pit. They covered that pit up with just some gravel, all that contaminated soil so that they could get their trains back running. Uh, they've been ordered to clean that up. They are cleaning that up, but meanwhile, they are exposing us to that contaminated soil and to the chemicals all over again. So while I appreciate, you know, our politicians for pushing for the bigger picture, right now, we need to get people out of their homes. We need Governor DeWine to declare that, you know, state of emergency, and we need people out. Uh, we've not even gotten so much as a bottle of water from our current politicians. I, I think as, you know, Currently, the NTSB uh, investigatory hearing is being held in East Palestine this week, and um, it was actually really refreshing. I went to the community meeting last night. Uh, Jamie was there as well, and we both were able to ask some questions and um, speak with Ms. Hamandi. Um, I, th I think that there are a lot of truths that are coming to the table, and it, like I said, it's refreshing. It's nice to see somebody that is for the people, which is what seems to you know, motivate the NTSB at this time. And so I'm confident that we'll continue to be able to move forward with some of those regulatory policies and that the NTSB will fight for us um, on those uh, in Congress at, at that level that we so desperately need to make change. So the NTSB is the National Transportation Safety Board and those hearings are actually this week, probably even as we speak. Julia, can you... I, I hear you, Jamie, I hear you, Jessica. You are actually living in a disaster zone right now as we also deal with what is happening right now, but also what could be prevented from happening. What is in this rail safety bill that could stop another East Palestine, Ohio from ever happening again? What would you pick out from that bill, Julia? So there are some things that are in it and there are some things that are not in it that uh -huh. the NTSB has recommended. Right. Okay. But uh, some some of the basic things that are in it are um, Im improving the, the wayside track detector system, which is basically a way um, for trains to detect problems that might lead to derailments. This was a huge issue, as is coming out in the field hearing, uh, where an overheated uh, wheel bearing was not uh, detected in time. So that's something that's in the bill, expanding the definition of a hazmat train is in the bill um, requiring on a, a, an ever so slightly faster timeline trains to improve the tank cars they use to ship chemicals is in the bill. Uh, what was removed from the Senate version of the bill during a committee hearing was a requirement that the transportation secretary set limits on train lengths. Um, that is coming out to be a big, everybody knew it was a yeah. big problem, but it's, it's been coming out so in the uh, field hearing as a big be, issue with this Julia, train. So a train could be, Julia, two miles long. 
So it could be going past your house and it's two miles long. And the longer the train, the more likely it is that something might go awry and then it's derailed. Did I understand that correctly? You understand that correctly. Well, yeah. and so the, the other sort of most important thing that's in the bill that we, we heard from one of the unions earlier is, is a requirement that train staff uh, with at least a two-person crew, which isn't very many people for On a, a two-mile long. long train, right, okay, right. <laughs> minimum. I, I'm going to bring in Erin Klein. Erin Klein is a resident from East Palestine, and she talks about how the residents are managing right now. Here's Erin. I think what we're seeing in these Palestinian and the surrounding communities is a lot of frustration and confusion and tension. I mean, there's some people that are just really frustrated trying to get the right answers to know if their air, their water, their soil is safe, and they're finding it either difficult to get those answers or um, doubting the reliability of the answers that are given to them. And that can be a frustrating place to be in. And I also see that there's a lot of discrepancy in the area. There are a lot of people that, um, that aren't sick and don't have any symptoms at the moment, so therefore think everything is okay. And then there are others that have experienced a lot of symptoms and a lot of sickness and are feeling just frustrated that they're unseen or unheard or unable to get the answers to feel confident in their health and the health of their family. So many questions for you from our viewers around the world. Brad says, for instance, Jessica, I'm going to put this to you. I'm curious if both the rail and the industrial chemical manufacturers are equally culpable in this catastrophe. That is a great question. Um, that is something that I actually post uh, this week to Mark Derno. Um, they have named, uh, the EPA has named Norfolk Southern as the responsible party at this time. And so they are responsible for the entire cleanup. Um, I did ask about, you know, Occidental Vinyl. Oxyvinyl is a, 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 I guess, someone that's asking questions at the, um, the NTSB hearing today, but I do think there's certainly a level of responsibility um, for, you know, Oxyvinyl to really step up and um, support the idea of improved rail safety because it is, you know, essentially their product that is poisoning us. So mm -hmm. it's an important distinction for sure. I'm going to play Sohel Hussain, who also talks about this. It's almost like there's an equation between how safe do we keep people and then how much do the politicians need to be persuaded before they will keep safety in mind? So how puts it m way better than I've put it. Here he is. Railroads are a really important part of our society. Unfortunately, the people of East Palestine witnessed an attempt at railroad efficiency at the cost of safety. Proactive policy changes like shorter trains, improved working conditions, and increased safety standards are ought to be prioritized by governments and corporations so that this style of derailment and environmental disaster that we saw in East Palestine can be prevented. So much common sense. All right, uh, Dante has a one word question, compensation, question mark. Jamie, what have you got so far? Uh, so far what we've gotten is reimbursement for our lodging and food. Um, the problem I have with that is they left Norfolk Southern in control of this. So it's like going to someone who abused you and begging them for help to make things right. The assistance center uh, is not equitable. They're not basing decisions on relocation and what expenses will be covered uh, by any scientific method. It depends on the human being that you deal with, their mood, how persistent you are. Uh, you know, they might say, Jessica lives across the street from me and she's eligible for relocation and I'm not. They might say, we'll give Jessica a six months le lease. Jamie, we're giving you a three month lease. You know, we're going to pay for all new clothes for you, Jessica. Jamie, you're only going to get food and lodging. There's no rhyme or reason to the way that the residents are being reimbursed. Uh, you know, we did receive a thousand dollar inconvenience check. Uh, right after the evacuation was lifted. Mm. But besides that, the only thing that we have seen uh, from Norfolk Southern is reimbursement for mainly lodging right. and food with no rhyme or reason to the way that they are giving that out to residents. Jamie and Jessica, you've been extraordinary in the way that you've really unpacked what happens to 
a neighbourhood, communities that are impacted by a catastrophe and what the community has to do and the residents have to do to make a difference. I'm going to leave you with a clip from this film. This is Loni Miller um, from the Fort Lines investigation called Derailed, investigating the US railroad industry. Jessica and Jamie is living it, but you can find out their experiences right here on Al Jazeera Fort Lines. Thanks for watching. My plan for us, I seen in the future, for us to leave this home to our son so he could have a good start in life. We don't know what the future holds. It's just uncertain. It's gonna be safe enough to stay here or should we get out of Dodge?